this is so exciting. Uh, we've been discussing your work for a long time now before you came here. And it's actually not that you're coming because you, you, you graduated from, from Columbia. So, so it's that you're coming back, right? And you're probably coming back to a different world, uh, but one that you've been announcing with your work. I think that your work is more relevant now than ever. And, and we can see now how much it was seen through your work and the way that you were reading reality, Imani. So uh, it's, it's really a joy to, to introduce you today and to welcome back, to welcome you back to, to GSAP or to Columbia. You've been here for many years. But to GSAP, where your work has been so much discussed and, uh, in, in, in the last years. I want to start by reading an excerpt from your book to the pigeons of my balcony, a love letter, the 2020 right, uh, book. You might not have noticed, but the world as we humans have known it, as we built it, is coming to an end. And the world burns, as the world burns, we despair and rejoice, other worlds await. I think this is what makes your work so exciting, that you're announcing how the world is, a world is sinking, but there's other worlds that are emerging. And that's what probably our work is now, really to make those, uh, to, to accelerate the, the sinking of a world that we don't want and to, to allow others to, to emerge. Imani Jacqueline Brown is an artist, activist, writer, and researcher from New Orleans, based between New Orleans and London, uh, or in London now, right, rather than New Orleans. And for her, I'd like to read more because I, I, I really love, and I think we, we all love your writing. The projects of colonialism, genocide, slavery, and fossil fuel production are faces of a single system of matter, wealth, culture, life, and soul dislocation known as extractivism. Extractivism operates on bodies and fractal scales, at fractal scales expanding from the scale of the cell, the decomposed bacterium, and the leaf of the three-corner marsh grass, to the scale of humans, oil fields, and they'll take flood plains. Extraction from one body is simultaneously extraction from the ecological body. Extraction from any body demands ecological solid solidarity and reparations. I think that this resounds with some of the most exciting work that has been done in the last years in the terrains of poetry, for instance, and I'm thinking of Audre Lorde and the way that bodies and territories are simultaneously uh, uh, being the sites of uh, 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 destruction, exploitation, and extraction. I think that your work uh, is sowing through archival research, ecological philosophy, legal theory, people's history, and counter cartographic strategy. Uh, the way spatial uh, logics uh, have made geographies and make communities and eventually the break of the Earth's geology. And I think this is something that we uh, as architects are part of, both personally and through our profession, and that basically it's the project that we have to undo and to confront now. Uh, you were the co-founder and artistic director from 2014 to 18 of the Blights Out, a collective in New Orleans, uh, a collective of artists and architects who seek to de de demystify and democratize development in the post Katrina New Orleans. A project of uh, Lights Out was the Living Glossary uh, that I really love, that spells out expanded definitions for ca casual real estate and development terms. These simple concepts fill our language, but the coded histories beneath their connotative meanings speak to a legacy of plan systemic oppression. Imani received her MA uh, with distinction from the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmith University of London in 2019 and her BA in Anthropology and Visual Arts from Columbia University in 2010. Among other things, you're currently a PhD candidate at University of London, a research fellow with forensic architecture and an associate lecturer in, MA, uh, uh, in, a, in the MA architecture program at the RCA, the Royal College of Arts. You were awarded, or Imani was awarded in 2021 uh, with the Black uh, Women Green Future Award. And in 2022, you presented, and uh, probably many of you saw it, 
this very impressive work, what, remain, what remains at the ends of the earth at the 12th uh, Ber Berlin Biennale for Contemporary Art. Laura Kurgan is going to be responding to Imani after your lecture. And it will be also a great moment. I know that there's so many connections between your work, Imani, and the work that Laura has been doing in the last, for the last decades, and also the work that you're doing now, Laura, uh, as director of the CDP program and to the Studio Center. So please uh, join me in welcoming Imani here today. This is going to be a very exciting session for us. Some histories are cast in the light of a falling star that extinguishes the dinosaurs and gives rise to the dawn of capitalists. Strange beasts that develop tools to segregate existence from itself and put us to work against our own interests. They drill 10,000 feet and 65 million years deep into subterranean oceans, black with soil and oil, life and death. Powers too great for the tool bearers to wield. They raise colonies of primordial bacteria from their slumber and put them to work powering a trillion electric stars that are viewable from space, but block the light of the old gas gods. That was when we were lost. In the beginning, there was oil. So read didactic texts at the New Orleans Audubon Aquarium until a few years ago, when it was altered following numerous complaints. The text sought to contextualize the tank at the heart of the aquarium. You arrive at the tank after slowly descending through the building on a spiraling downward slope, passing enclosures showcasing creatures and representing landscapes from around the world, as well as the harm caused by human societies to those ecosystems, logging in the Amazon, seahorse fishing in China. Finally, you behold the centerpiece, a two-story tank representing the Gulf of Mexico, supported by the logos of Shell, Chevron, BP, and ExxonMobil. At the center of a tank stands a strange structure. It's a scaled replica of an oil rig. The rig is circumnavigated by endangered sharks, stingrays, and sea turtles. The exhibit is propaganda for the Federal Rigs Tariffs Program, which permits oil and gas companies to leave thousands of defunct rigs standing in the ocean. They claim that the chemical-laden husks have become artificial reefs, beneficial to sea life. Unlike every other exhibit in the aquarium, here there is no mention of the deleterious impact of human activity on the Gulf ecosystem. There is no mention of the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the largest in US history, which spilled five billion barrels of oil chased with toxic chemical dispersants, ravaging human and more than human ecological communities in Louisiana's coastal zone. Instead, there is this pernicious perpetuation of a quasi-biblical myth that oil is the source of everything we hold dear in Louisiana, that oil and gas built Louisiana. The politicians and corporations and institutions that pander this myth do so in full knowledge of the truth. That extractivism's cosmological guidelines have led us to the ends of the earth. That oil and gas has destroyed Louisiana. It is our responsibility to look beyond this imposed horizon to see for ourselves and ask what remains at the ends of the earth. This image is a picture of New Orleans, 
albeit captured from an unusual vantage. You might be able to just make out the city's signature landmarks, the dome of the Superdome, beneath a cloud of smog from a nearby wetland fire on the horizon. I captured this photo in January of 2022 from a three-passenger propeller plane, uh, the flight of which was made possible by the nonprofit South Wings. This is also an image of Hurricane Katrina. Katrina hit New Orleans on August 29, 2005, leaving 80% of New Orleans underwater, thousands of black folks stranded on their rooftops, 100,000 black folks permanently displaced from their homes, and 1,800 people dead. The storm revealed the underlying truth behind so-called natural disasters, that they're highly curated events. This image is a picture of Katrina because it reveals the more than meteorological forces behind that unnatural disaster. Before the city stretch our once fecund coastal wetlands, our ecological skin, the sole buffer between hundreds of more than human communities and the increasingly powerful and frequent hurricanes that roll in off the Gulf of Mexico. When Katrina hit New Orleans, this precious coastal geography had already been whiplashed and fragmented by 70 years of oil and gas extraction that led to one of the fastest rates of coastal erosion in the world. 2,000 square miles lost at a rate of one football field every 45 minutes. This is also a picture of the Lafitte oil field, once one of the most productive sources of oil and gas in Louisiana. In the 1930s, when oil and gas was discovered in Louisiana's wetlands, oil companies searched for the most cost-effective ways to access the vast subterranean fields. But the wetlands got in the way. They were thick with mud and vegetation, and carried themselves with a trickster energy. A patch of flotant appearing in one moment to be solid ground would transform to water in the next. Roads just couldn't hold up, and muskrats gnawed away at wooden board rocks they tried to erect. So to hell with them. They decided to just cut their way on through. Since the 1930s, over 100 oil and gas corporations have dredged over 10,000 linear miles of canals in order to drill over 90,000 wells. Here you can see more clearly the architecture of access canals. After decades of land to water turnover, all that remains are the skeletal outlines of the canals, now uncannily suspended in open water by their spoil banks. Artificial levees formed when the dredged sediment was simply tossed to the side of the newly dredged canal. The high ground led to hypoxia and other forms of ecological degradation. Oil and gas canals allow salt water to funnel in from the Gulf of Mexico into brackish and freshwater wetlands. The salt kills the vegetation that holds sediment together as land. Without that vegetation, the sediment simply disintegrates and floats out to sea. While healthy wetlands absorb the energy of hurricanes, slowing them down, draining their strength, these devegetated, desiccated wetlands are hit by hurricanes like a bomb. The canal on the right was exploded by the impact of Hurricane Ida, which hit on Katrina's 16th anniversary on August 29, 2021. The disasters of extractivism roll out like sine waves, one after the other. How and when does it end? From those 90,000 wells in the coastal wetlands, oil is pumped upriver through 50,000 miles of pipelines, which largely terminate 100 miles or so upriver in a region known to industry these days as the petrochemical corridor. Here, hundreds of the nation's most polluting petrochemical plants, refineries, and oil and gas storage tank farms straddle both sides of the Mississippi River. They occupy the fallow footprints of slave-powered, of formerly slave-powered sugarcane plantations. The first nickname granted to this region was plantation country. This plant is the mosaic agrico diammonium phosphate fertilizer plant. The products from this plant are 
uh, trucked upriver to farms in America's bread belt, and they return to Louisiana in the form of runoff that forms one of the largest hypoxic zones in North America, a dead, a dead zone where little uh, sea life can, can survive. Mosaic occupies part or all of six antebellum plantations and neighbors the small majority black descendant communities of Welcome and Lemonville, Louisiana. The residents are descendants of people formerly enslaved on those very grounds. The emissions of Mosaic's plant include ammonia, an irritant of the skin and mucosal system, carcinogenic benzene and nitrogen oxides, and PM2.5, PM2 a respiratory irritant. In the 1980s, residents of the River Parishes nicknamed their homeland Cancer Alley. So Louisiana's coastal wetlands bear the entirety of the fossil fuel production cycle. And here at its terminus, the petrochemical plantation contains all of the successive layers of violence of the continuum of extractivism. Extractivism is a system that was first imposed by French, Spanish, German, joint stock companies, maintained by their US American colonial successors, and carried into the present by multinational oil and gas corporations. But extractivism is more than the systemic removal of resources from the earth or labor from human beings. It's a cosmology, a worldview, that holds financial profit as the pinnacle of value. To accumulate the world, extractive agents must parcel or divide existence against itself. It applies a force of segregation to integral ecologies. Human beings are segregated from our wider ecological bodies. Black bodies are segregated from the body of humanity. Sugarcane production was historically so grueling that the plantations of the lower Mississippi Delta bore a negative demographic birth rate among the enslaved population. Each plantation therefore required at least one and as many as three burial grounds to hold its dead. So as the plants in Cancer Alley toxify the air breathed by black descendant communities, it also crushes the remains of their ancestors. But sometimes these burial grounds survive and even thrive as new life. Groves of trees planted by the historically enslaved to mark the graves of their loved ones. We might think of these sacred groves as portals that enable us to traverse the continuum of extractivism and perhaps even reveal ways to rupture it, gesturing to other cosmologies that center other ways of being in the world. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, my family was displaced along with so many others, and I eventually made my way to New York where I pursued my BA here at Columbia. The year I graduated, 2010, the BP oil spill erupted in the Gulf of Mexico. Residents spoke of the stench of oil in the air, slick in puddles of rain. Communities suffered cascading health problems. Species died off, disappeared, mutated. It felt as though the world hadn't ended during Katrina, but that it would finally end now. And yet again, life continued. The following year in New York, I experienced a personal rebirth as Occupy Wall Street erupted in Zuccotti Park. Then in 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit the city, and I participated in the Occupy Sandy relief effort, getting homes and supporting residents in Far Rockaway. I saw disaster capitalist vultures swooping in. I knew that I needed to return home to see what those same forces had done to New Orleans. And so I returned to a city filled with a housing crisis and 50,000 unoccupied so-called blighted homes. They were trapped in debtor's prisons due to predatory blight fines levied by the city after Katrina in order to flip properties and gentrify the city. I co-founded a grassroots initiative, uh, a collective of artists, activists, and architects called Blights Out. But that's another story. Thus began my quest to uncover the layers of extractive violence and racial oppression that created the ground conditions, the racialized and sacrificed geographies inherited from colonialism and slavery that produced more than meteorological events like Katrina. In 2018, uh, 
I founded an organization, um, uh, a festival called Fossil Free Fest. When I had returned to the city, I saw it wasn't just blighted with unoccupied homes. It was blighted by oil and gas logos that had been erupting upon the facades of our beloved arts, educational, and science institutions. Jazz and Heritage Festival had become the Jazz and Heritage Festival presented by Shell. French Quarter Festival was presented by Chevron. Satchmo Fest, Louis Armstrong's festival, presented by Chevron. The New Orleans Center for, Cre for Creative Arts hosted the Chevron Forum, and so on and so forth. I was working then as director of programs at Antenna, a small multi-arts organization, and the, den the then director, Bob Sneed, a hero of mine, had the guts to say, let's do it. I had been dreaming of Fossil Free Fest for, for four years, and in 2018, we realized it. It was truly courageous in a city that has next to no public funding for the arts. And so I started to organize my colleagues in the arts sector, speaking to so many administrators of organizations that were funded by oil and gas companies. And I was met with a lot of fear. People were afraid of just showing up, of being a part of a conversation, of being seen. They were afraid that their organizations would be defunded and closed. And so Fossil Free Fest tried to offer a space of um, togetherness, not of shame but of working through these complexities, working through this complicity and recognizing that with complicity also comes the agency to revoke your complicity. In New Orleans, we recognize that times of transition, times like death, are best met with community and celebration. And so Fossil Free Fest aimed to follow in the footsteps of our great second line traditions, West and Central African uh, funeral traditions, cultural retentions. Um, by offering a space to celebrate the end of the fossil fuel era and locate ourselves within a just transition. What good is it if our building's lights are on, but they're underwater? Who is truly benefiting from fossil fuel philanthropy if those people, those communities most impacted by fossil fuel development aren't part of those museums' publics? So amid food and music and performance and visual art, we held these difficult conversations. And I also had heard a lot of, uh, a, a lot of comments about, from, from my colleagues about the fact that, well, you know, my oil and gas funded, uh, my oil and gas funder is not one of the most responsible for environmental degradation in Louisiana. And I knew that evidence to the contrary existed but that I needed to develop new tools to mobilize that knowledge. And so I moved to London to pursue my MA in research architecture at Goldsmiths Center for Research Architecture. At Goldsmiths, I started digging into the state archives in Louisiana uh, that revealed the origins of our cultural myths, like oil and gas built Louisiana. And my research brought me to this concept of the continuum of extractivism but it wasn't just a figment of my imagination. It's encoded in the state's own archives. So here's the continuum of extractivism in the state's own words. In a 1938 issue of the Louisiana Conservation Review, a magazine produced by the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources, which manages the state's mineral resources. And it reads, the first chapter in the romantic history of natural gas in Louisiana begins with a picture of 15 Husky Negro slaves laboriously toiling under a crude tripod on the banks of Cane River at Bermuda, 10 miles south of Natchitoches in North Louisiana. And I worked with long-term friend and co-conspirator Scott Eustace of Healthy Gulf to learn how to access the state's permit records through the database of Louisiana's Department of Natural Resources. And so here are pages from the permit application for an oil and gas access canal dredged by the Colonial Pipeline Company which just about says it all. <laughs> Environmental lawyer Oliver Hook notes that it's difficult to see the vast scale of ecological destruction from the ground. In a canoe or a piro, you pass the, a tongue of brown water that just seems as innocent as can be. And it's only when you ascend in a small plane 
or in a satellite image that the expanding horizon of canals comes into view. And so to comprehend both the spatial and temporal scales of violence, we need to adopt a di diverse ways of seeing and sensing the world around us. Through satellite image, imagery, I learned to adopt a bird's eye or an ancestor's eye point of view. Using Google Earth Pro, I learned how to navigate satellite imagery for the first time, locating my pre-Katrina pre home, and then following my line of sight out to the expanding horizon of canals. As a local, this way of seeing expanded my own bodily awareness, my awareness of my ecological body. So years before Healthy Gulf and South Wings offered me the wonderful opportunity to see my home from a propeller plane, I first learned to see through the eyes of a satellite. But I knew that this image was incomplete, begging more questions than answering them. Where are the mechanical apparatuses that led to this coastal land loss? And if this land has been lost, well, who lost them? So the coordinate lines and points from the Department of Natural Resources permit database were spatialized as GIS lines and points. And I downloaded them into QGIS, which is a free open source geographic information system software. These shape files were available for public download until April 2021, when the files inexplicitly vanished. I spent hundreds of hours, most of 2020, organizing these lines and points by company, and you can see a few of them here. There are over 100 companies there, but um, a lot of them have actually merged or been acquired by other corporations. So if we want to think about corporate accountability, um, we actually have to know not just who the pipelines and canals and wells were permitted to, but who are the operators today? So I spent a lot of time using the best available data in order to research the succession of oil companies. And something that I like to say when I'm in the UK, because I think they'll understand it, is much like the crown, oil and gas companies don't die. They merely are succeeded. So the result of all of that work is Follow the Oil, an online mapping platform that aimed to bring satellite viewing to a broad public to explain the process and impacts of fossil fuel production on more than human ecologies and to reveal those corporations responsible. So what you're seeing here is a small excerpt from the platform scrolling narrative. Um, and it maps all of the uh, generalized oil and gas wells, as well as pipelines. And it also uses corporate logos from carbon, for all the carbon majors to plot all of their wells. And I, I see these corporate logos as flags. Um, the flags are planted across cities like New Orleans on our cultural institutions, trying to claim the conquest of, uh, and responsibility for our beloved um, institutions. But there is a place where they um, more properly belong, and, and that's on um, these sites of devastation. This is the land that has been um, conquered um, uh, and colonized. Um, so here we can see how plotting the canals and pipelines and wells enables to, us to see some of this subsurface geology. The oil and gas actually pools around the perimeters of subterranean salt domes. Um, and here in what's known as the Chevron Wagon Wheel, formerly um, the territory of Texaco, which, is a, uh, uh, which was succeeded by Chevron, um, they tried to find the most cost-effective way to access that oil, and so they experimented with dredging canals in a circular formation around the perimeter of the salt dome. And then following the oil from uh, to the Chevron Wagon Wheel, through a pipeline, we arrive back at the Lafitte oil field, which is where the presentation began. And here we um, take a look at some permits for oil and gas wells, uh, as well as for pipelines. This permit was issued for a mere $50, um, probably a really great return on their investment there. And from here, 
um, I was able to access uh, data on the actual production, um, the, uh, the production stats from uh, a sample of 250 wells. There are over 500 wells um, owned by Chevron today in this oil field. Um, and uh, by comparing uh, the barrels of oil produced over a 20 year period from each well, um, with the value, the dollar value of oil, of a barrel of oil at the time, adjusting it for inflation, I was able to calculate the dollar value of oil extracted from that sample of 250 wells over a 20 year period um, and attempted to visualize it um, in a way that um, would make it kind of um, a bit more, make this very abstract figure a bit more um, tangible. Uh, so from those 250 wells over a 20 year period, uh, $27 billion worth of oil was extracted. So this figure um, just gives us a small glimpse into the vast quantities of wealth extracted um, from Louisiana's wetlands over time. Um, it's not actually a calculation of profit. Um, for that, we need to know uh, the company's expenses, and I would be very happy to receive that information. Um, so the, the platform narrative ends with the concept of unjust enrichment, which is an equitable principle that says that um, if one entity, a corporation or a person, profits from activities that impoverish another entity, those profits are unjust and must be restituted. Um, so ending here, um, you know, I wanted to offer up unjust enrichment as you know, a, an operational concept for us to understand what has been done to us, but also a way out. One of the major problems with um, you know, reparations claims is this question of, well, how much is owed? You know, so the folks usually focus on damages. You know, what was the harm done and how do we quantify it? The problem is, that human rights atrocities and environmental violence are unquantifiable. How do you calculate the value of a human life? How do you calculate the value of complex ecosystems that we don't even fully understand? You can't. And so unjust enrichment puts the focus on profit rather than on damages. How much was extracted? That's what's owed. So in 2018, a new plant decided to um, jump on the Cancer Alley bandwagon. Formosa Plastics announced plans to construct a 3.5 square mile plastic noodles production facility across four antebellum plantations in St. James Parish County in Louisiana. Um, a noodle is a plastic pellet, the smallest unit of plastic production. Um, and I am going to let um, the amazing Sharon Levine introduce this next work. My name is Sharon Levine. I'm the director and founder of Rise St. James, right here in St. James Parish. And we are here to commemorate the graves of our enslaved ancestors. We're going to stand together. That's right. And we're going to fight for Mosa. Right. We will not allow them to take our ancestors out of this ground yeah. and put them somewhere else. Right. We are Rise St. James, and we're going to stand up for St. James Parish. This is our home. We're not going anywhere. Yeah. Formosa has a, have a fight on their hands. Mm. So as soon as Formosa announced its plans, Rise St. James member Gail LaBeouf said, there are graves on that property. And so they organized with the Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, uh, Pam Spees is here actually in New York. Um, and uh, an archeologist with Coastal Environments Inc. Um, in order to try to see if those graves could actually be located. So uh, Don Hunter with Coastal Environments Inc. Um, uh, reviewed the, cardio the cartographic record and actually found three mapped cemeteries on that property. It's actually quite amazing that these three cemeteries were found all in a row on these maps for reasons that'll um, become clear a bit later. Um, and uh, forensic architecture, uh, a human rights and environmental violence investigative agency based in London, based at Goldsmiths, um, invited me to initiate an investigation into Louisiana. So I didn't know where to even start. I mean, like the ecological crisis we're facing is, is quite large. Um, there are many possible entry points. 
Um, so I convened um, a group of residents of St. James, including members of Rise St. James. They're legal advocates from a number of organizations. Um, and uh, we put our heads together, and it was very clear that the burial grounds were the place to start. Um, so RISE and the Center for Constitutional Rights challenged forensic architecture uh, to develop a methodology for locating antebellum black burial grounds across a wide region prior to industry announcing a new project and, and breaking ground. Um, and so we selected a 60 kilometer area spanning parts of Ascension, St. James, and St. John the Baptist parishes as our focus area. And we pulled data from the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality on six toxic and criteria air pollutants with impacts of human health to start, to paint a picture of the contemporary situation. Um, those uh, pollutants are ammonia, benzene, chloroprene, chloroprene, ethylene oxide, nitrogen oxides, and PM2.5. And working with Imperial College London, unfortunately named, but they do great work. Um, they're world leaders in fluid dynamics, uh, we produce a simulation of the movement of those six pollutants across space and time. And we modeled three separate days, each with distinct prevailing wind conditions, in order to reveal which communities were caught in the plume's paths. So majority black communities in the fifth district, um, where Sharon Levine um, and other members of RISE live, were disproportionately impacted the predominant wind direction blew the plumes directly over their communities. But the simulation also revealed something else, something that Sharon Levine likes to say, which is that toxic air does not obey geopolitical borders. Um, everyone gets caught in the toxic plumes. So sometimes the wind blows the plumes north toward the state capital of Baton Rouge, and sometimes it blows them south toward New Orleans. And sometimes, the majority white communities that voted against the construction of plants in their own backyards, but did not oppose the construction of plants in majority black communities, are also taught in the toxic, caught in the toxic clouds. And so from there, we needed to travel back in time in order to trace the foundations upon which this industry stands and locate the burial grounds at risk from future industrial development. And so we source visual materials spanning 140 years, beginning with post-bellum coast surveys of the region. With all of the materials, we geo-reference them, meaning that we pin their coordinates to the coordinate grid and contemporary satellite images. So these two um, maps are from uh, 1878 and 1894. Um, and there's a lot to say about what it means that they are post rather than anti-bellum, um, but we, perhaps we can save it for conversation. So the surveys depict riverside plantations in surprising detail. And we studied and traced all of the lines that were encoded therein. We traced the plantation borders and field paths, the sugar mills and slave quarters, and noted when, on two dozen occasions, burial grounds are mapped, albeit with an inconsistent symbolic logic. And yet, with hundreds of plantations in the region, each necessitating one to three burial grounds, we knew that there were many holes in the historic record that needed to be filled. And so our analysis of the typological organizational logics, where is the slave master's big house in relation to the sugar mill, in relation to the slave quarters, enabled us to hypothesize where missing burial grounds were likely to be located. And then we continued our progression back toward the present by sourcing six decades of aerial photography. So we georeferenced them as well and created a portal that allows us to move back and forth in time, revealing both the permanence of the uh, organizational logics inscribed into the earth by colonialism and slavery, as well as the transformations of the land over time as industry became increasingly heavy. And so by comparing historical maps with these aerial and satellite images, we could see how the symbolic representation of plantation cemeteries approximates the actual topography. So this is the Homa's Plantation Cemetery, which is named after the indigenous Homa people who were dispossessed from this territory and pushed to the disintegrating edges of land. 
The oval shape here matches onto the grove of trees. So today this property is owned by Shell Oil Company. They own the Shell Convent Refinery on the adjacent three or four plantations. And in 2013, they plan to expand those facilities onto this neighboring land. And so uh, they conducted a federally mandated archaeological survey. But they made a mistake. They hired Coastal Environments Inc., the same firm that was later to work with Rye St. James to identify uh, plantation cemeteries on Formosa's property. They hired the one firm among the rash of for-profit archaeological firms who actually care about history and people. So Coastal Environments Inc., in partnership with Environmental Resource Management, located this burial ground along with two others on the property. They identified the people interred therein and estimated that there were around 1,000 people buried there. And they also analyzed the trees on site and concluded that the trees are partly the remains of the primordial forest, which was clear to make way for fields of cane. But it, there's also something else going on there. So first, just to establish why it is that we see this grove of trees surrounded by fields of sugarcane. Sugarcane is a crop of scale. And so over the decades, as a planter's wealth increased, fields were slowly cultivated from the edge of the, the river on back to the back swamps, cultivated by enslaved hands, clearing the forest where enslaved people buried their dead. So as the forest recedes, the burial ground becomes an island uh, lost amid seas of cane. So the groves are a remnant of the primordial, the primordial forest, but they're also more than natural. Enslaved people planted specific species of trees, magnolias and willows, in order to mark the graves of their loved ones. And the archeological report suggests that the trees on site today are actually the descendants of trees that were planted by the historically enslaved. So whenever a grove of trees or other topographical information formations interrupts the otherwise seamless tapestry of sugarcane fields, archeologists call it a top topographical anomaly. And so in the 1940s aerial mosaic, we identified over a thousand groves of trees. This is a selection of six that are highly likely to be antebellum black burial grounds based on their relative location on the plantation. These six have all been destroyed by industrial activity, whether ongoing plowing um, or uh, petrochemical development. By the 2021 uh, satellite images, only 350 or so of those groves remained. Now it's important to say that not all groves of trees are going to be burial grounds. Sometimes vegetation traces the ruins of the slave quarter and sugar mill complex. Um, those uh, ruins are also incredibly valuable cultural and historic properties that can teach us a lot about our history um, and our culture in Louisiana, and they also deserve protection. But some of them are likely to be burial grounds. Um, and this process of erasure um, affects human communities as much as their cultural resources, such as the um, historic black free town of Lyons that was a small rural community until the encroachment of Marathon Petroleum Corporation and Cargill Inc., which has completely surrounded the community, um, left all, uh, erased all but five homes, and has surrounded two cemeteries that were likely in both antebellum and postbellum use. And actually, Marathon Petroleum owns a portion of one cemetery. So this work with forensic architecture has been mobilized um, by local residents in their legal efforts to block um, constru the construction of Formosa, South Louisiana Methanol, the Greenfield development, and other industrial properties. This is an excerpt from an affidavit that we filed on behalf of the Descendants Project um, and their lawsuit against um, an industrial grain elevator that would cross several antebellum plantations and actually stand taller than the Statue of Liberty. And actually recently, I should say, in March of this year, 
um, the Center for Constitutional Rights on behalf of Rise St. James and in Inclusive Louisiana um, actually filed a legal complaint demanding a moratorium on all industrial development in St. James Parish. It was filed in federal court. So it's really exciting and I look forward to seeing where that goes. And in fact, there, there is hope um, because in September of last year, um, a Louisiana judge actually quoted Sharon Levine and reaffirmed um, her perspective on land worked by historically enslaved people as being sacred and deserving of protection. So Sharon Levine of Rise St. James explained, these are sacred lands. They were pa passed down to black residents from their great, great, great grandparents who worked hard to buy these lands to make them productive and pass them on to their families. The court further unpacks the meaning of these are sacred lands. The blood, sweat, and tears of their ancestors is tied to the land. And so Sharon's recognition of the sacred quality of land carries forward the beliefs of her historically enslaved African, African-American ancestors. The forests in the back swamps at the margins of antebellum plantations across Louisiana were always spaces of freedom, temporary autonomous zones. Ex-slave narratives testify to enslaved people retracing the paths of their daily toil, crossing miles of sugarcane fields in the embrace of the night to perform ritual and dance in the forest, sneaking back to their quarters before morning roll call. In the forest, they exchanged food and secrets with self-emancipated black folk, also known as maroons who founded infamous villages all throughout the swamps, not just in Louisiana, but all across the Deep South, all across the Americas. They inspired a wealth of folklore. The forested back swamps were freedom lands in part because they were feared by the settler colonists who could not control them. They saw them as wastelands infested by alligators and swamps and made every effort to drain them and log them into submission but it didn't work. So burial grounds are precious survivals of those forests, those freedom lands, and they're also carefully cultivated mic microecologies. Enslaved people did not simply plant those trees as grave markers for lack of stone. They planted those trees in order to carry on these West and Central African ecological praxis that emerged from cosmologies that said that ancestral spirits reside in the crowns of trees. Those praxis adapted to the forests of the Americas, syncretizing with indigenous belief and knowledge. A world's forest, an ecological diaspora, blooms into being, uniting Louisiana with Haiti, Cuba, Brazil, Dahomey, Congo, and beyond. In collaboration with their, more than, with their human descendants, more than human sacred groves hold down the front lines of resistance against the perpetuation and expansion of the petrochemical corridor. Trees extend their roots, garnished in mycelial threads, to revitalize lands stagnated by monocrop agriculture. They extend their leaves and branches, resuscitating air asphyxiated by industrial pollutants. And they do their humblest to pull down the carbon dioxide that is propelled by these plants against the world's horizon. To say that the land on which enslaved people were worked to death is sacred is not merely to speak of the firma terra that holds their interred bodies. Franz Fanon wrote that for a colonized people, the most important value is land, for it offers bread and dignity. Yet for land to bestow dignity upon colonized human beings, the dignity of the land must be defended and honored. Thus the word land is merely a placeholder for the fullness of our integrated ecological systems. As the soil is sacred, so are the trees that hold sediment together as land. So are the mycelial threads that weave the roots of trees together, passing messages between them. So is the air that is produced by the leaves of those trees. And so are the living human beings that breathe the air produced by the leaves clinging to the trees whose roots, whose roots hold the land together. Swamps everywhere are involved in cycles of becoming otherwise. 
Life becomes death and death begets life. Soil and water ebb and flow and everything mixes in the murky light. So there's a reason why the marshlands born of riverine deltas from Iraq to Egypt, to Nigeria, to Louisiana are cradles of biodiversity and of civilizations. Before colonists enslaved her and erased her given name 300 years ago, Louisiana was known as Bulbancha, meaning land of many languages in Mobilian, a unifying trade dialect of Choctaw. The vibrations of shared language wove together over two dozen ind indigenous nations who gathered in the Mississippi River Delta in New Orleans to trade. The Mobilian language speaks to the heart of Louisiana. It reminds us that she is a place of convergence, integration, and flow. For 300 years, colonialism has forced us to settle, to be stiff and still, to resist the Delta's imperative to flow and to change. The time for change is now. If segregation is the productive force of the cosmology of extractivism, then we need cosmologies grounded in ecological reintegration. What remains at the ends of the earth is ecological reparations, not just humans, but whole ecosystems conspiring, which means to breathe together. Today, across Louisiana, residents refuse quick profit and false solutions, and they prefer to ask, what does it mean to continue the work of our ancestors? Thank you. Thanks, Imani. It was, you know, I've heard you give this as a 20-minute talk, and this was, what, an hour? Um, I think it could be two hours. I think people could listen to you um, talk forever. I don't know, I don't know if you all agree, but, um, you know, just this last part where you were saying um, that Louis Louisiana was called the land of many languages. You're speaking so many languages in the way that you deliver this talk. And I think that that's what's so sort of overwhelming and, um, and hard to respond to in one. And also it's one project, you know. So I love the way that you, um, that you narrate your trajectory and, and the urgency with which you then took on um, you know, going further and digging deep <laughs> and high, you know, very deep and very high up into the sky on, on, um, uh, for, this, for these in this one particular, in this one particular site. And then also, um, you know, I have seen, I can't describe to you how many maps I've seen of the oil fields and the wells and the pipelines um, in that particular region um, of Los Angeles. And there's a certain amount of images that also, that always say um, ecological justice or environmental justice and petrochemical, the petrochemical district, that's, that's one of them. There have been a lot of um, maps drawn and Lindy is sitting right there in front of me and Kate Orff and um, many, many, many people. But the way that you did it, um, that, um, that brings accountability um, to it, it was just so smart, you know, just not only, not only drawing the lines, but assembling the data and uh, excavating the data, which is not easy to do, right? And as we all know, and especially forensic architecture, um, data doesn't speak for itself, you have to. And so, um, so I think that where you started there with the expenses um, being this unjust um, enrichment, which then must be restituted, um, and then from there going, you know, into these burial, the burial grounds and the trees, which are the markers, and not knowing exactly who was buried and how, and that these trees are on private lands, and I don't know, you can just, um, you can really, um, really go on forever. So, um, and then it all comes together in this affidavit, in this affidavit that you've, you know, that you've sent out, which might or might not, you know, bring the results that you're 
that you're asking for, but you're asking so many different layers, um, layers of things. So I just want to, I don't know, congratulate you. I don't even have, I really don't have um, questions, you know, because I think it's all so, um, it's all so well drawn out. So I don't know, they, I, I, I would prefer, I think, maybe just that you, there's an amazing audience on this side with really great faculty, and I have some amazing students here um, as well, and I think everybody uh, might might have um, might have questions to sort of just to sort of open it up, especially in your methodology, in terms of your your methodology and how you hope. Maybe I can ask a question. <laughs> I'll ask one um, because I, yeah, because I I just learned that you're doing a geography PhD, which I think is such a great idea. Um, we were talking about it a little bit before the audience um, showed up. And I think, um, I think that that is a really great way of, of continuing your research. So are you thinking of continuing this to other sites, like you were saying, Haiti, the Congo? Yeah, what are you, what are you planning to do just in terms of your PhD? And the other question, so that, that's one question. And the other question is, how did this thing start? Um, because you were already doing work in New Orleans, and then you said forensic architecture um, commissioned you to do the work about. But where did it start? Did, did the idea start with you, or did somebody come to them? How, how did that? So those two questions, and then we'll open it up. Sure. So to start with the second question, I guess. Yeah. Um, so forensic architecture always, you know, tries to work by invitation. They don't like to, they like to stay in their lane. Yeah. So they like to have someone from an affected community come to them with a case and ask them to work on it. Um, uh, or, you know, the, a, a victim's family or, or mm -hmm. lawyers, for example. Um, so I, you know, I, I actually, I, I went to London. I, I learned about forensic architecture in 2014 mm -hmm. um, at a conference in Cuba um, that I attended. And it was um, the year, it was, at, it was not long after I left New York. Um, and so I was, I wrote this paper kind of reflecting on Occupy Wall Street from my vantage in New Orleans. And I went to Cuba and went to this conference and the conveners um, suggested that I look at forensic architecture, and I hadn't, you know, um, been familiar with them before. And so I started dreaming and scheming mm -hmm. um, about them conducting an investigation into um, any of this, like, vast array of um, human environmental uh, atrocities, rights atrocities mm -hmm. in Louisiana. Um, and I never expected that it would be me actually doing that. But I went to the master's program and I you know, just kind of kept pushing. My, my master's work was, was mapping the pipelines and wells and I just kind of kept pushing it mm -hmm. um, at Egal Weissman, um, the director, look over here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. um, and so I was, I was brought on, I was, I was asked to, um, I was recruited by forensic architecture um, in part to uh, do work on the investigation into police brutality against Black Lives Matter protesters during 2020, mm -hmm. um, and then invited to launch an investigation um, into something in Louisiana. And so that's how okay. that okay. got so started. Okay, so they knew about that. It's, yeah, okay, yeah. that's great. Uh -huh. um, in terms of the PhD, um, and so yes, it's a PhD in geography, which I chose um, in part, as I was saying before, because I wanted a really legitimate sounding degree, um, because I love you know, the interdisciplinary um, creative work. Um, and I also have been engaging with the legal sphere um, right. recently, which is very um, stiff and, and kind of um, very you know, linear in thinking in a lot of ways. And so um, actually that affidavit um, I delivered testimony to that affidavit um, to a St. John the Baptist Parish court um, <laughs> remotely um, last June, and it was really intense, as I guess you know it's, it would always be. Um, but getting tendered as an expert witness um, was really difficult, you know. Um, uh, so I, I knew I needed to do a PhD, and I wanted to have a PhD that was just like very easily. Um, understandable. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm doing it with Catherine Youssef, and so, you know, she's very creative and um, uh, open, and so, you know, I feel like I'm still able to work in the same way. Um, and yes, um, so 
all of my work, you know, it's just, I've just kind of been, you know, um, I've, I've been moving along this, this path and I don't know what's going to come next, but, you know, the research that I do, the people I am in community with, um, you know, one thing just kind of leads to the next. And so um, I want to continue from the grounds of these burial grounds and, and really trace this practice of planting trees across yeah. the African diaspora. Um, and so what I've learned already, yeah. it's really fun. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've learned already is that, you know, this, this, these groves, when I say that they could be considered sacred groves, like that's a term um, for these um, groves of trees um, across the continent, um, all across, like, you know, four corners of the continent, but also certainly West and Central Africa, where the majority of enslaved people in Louisiana came from. Um, uh, sacred groves are these, you know, uh, spaces that will hold altars and serve as ritual space and, and are protected. They are, you yeah. know, um, indigenous conservation spaces. Um, and uh, they're only one of, you know, a kind of vast, you know, constellation of, of different types of ecological practices that stem from, um, uh, like, this diverse array of cosmologies. And they have a lot of things in common. Right. Including this, you know, belief that spirits are held in the crowns of trees. So I'm tracing, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm basically tracing um, human and tree relationships to, uh, uh, from Louisiana back to Haiti. So 10,000 people um, migrated from Haiti via Cuba to Louisiana after the Haitian Revolution, um, really influencing uh, voodoo in, in New Orleans and in Louisiana in general. Right. And then back to um, West and Central Africa. So I'm um, looking to the places where enslaved people in Louisiana and Haiti were extracted from. Um, so Senegambia being a major place, um, Benin, Togo, um, Congo, Angola, um, this right. area. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I have and to figure out how to uh, narrow yeah. it down. <laughs> It's hard. It really sounds like needles in the haystack. So you have, you really have to find a site that you know um, has this, has not only the history, but where the houses were and the. Anyway, it's going to be amazing. It's, yeah, it's exciting, it's and it's hard. it's the site research. I mean, like that's going to be the most amazing bit. But but right. even like the you know trying to figure out like what are my archives? Um, right, because they're not going to be consistent. Yeah. And, you know, and I've, I've been reading Sadia Hartman's Lose Your Mother and just really wondering, you know, whether her path is my path. Like, you know, the violence of the colonial archive, thinking on the one hand that, well, you know, maybe they're like trees are present in these archives, but, you know, um, they've, they've been overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, and, and should I go through all of that? Should I put myself through that um, in order to try to find traces? And I've been increasingly thinking, well, actually, Perhaps the archives of, of this project are folklore, yeah. um, ex-slave narratives, which are mm -hmm. you know, extremely valuable, very heart-wrenching as well, um, looking into spiritual practices. So I was mm -hmm. just in New Orleans, and I met with um, uh, a Yoruban um, priestess in New Orleans, Mama Sula, um, and I was you know, telling her a little bit about this project, and I mentioned the Oroko tree, which is considered sacred in West Africa. And she immediately started singing this song uh, about yeah, the Oroko yeah. and the Oroko tree and um, the um, what one would kind of casually and incorrectly call deities that you know are associated with the Oroko tree um, translate in Haiti to um, the silk cotton tree, mm -hmm. um, and Oroko becomes. Papa Loco, and um, so there's anyway. So it's been it's been fascinating. I mean, I've yeah. been finding it's there's there's so much um, right. in these types of archives, and it's very revitalizing to you know go through this process of discovery or, or recovery of, of this That's, you know this knowledge. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna open it up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. First, Ivan, and then sorry, what's your name? Oh. Yeah. Well, many thanks for. Okay, many thanks for this incredible lecture. I think that it was an, an incredible uh, project. And my question is very much related to this um, last part of your answer, in a way, um, precisely to um, even Saidiya Harman's uh, approach, even to what the archive uh, could be. Um, you show an incredible amount of um, documents 
Sometimes there were plans, sometimes there were photographs, affidavits, but also um, just like, for example, oral histories in a way, or other kind of narratives. And my question would be, how do you approach this um, different nature of what evidences could be and what kind of knowledge also could be not extracted, but how could be entangled with the other knowledges and the other uh, narratives that you are showing in a way. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess one thing that I didn't say during the presentation that's really important to say is, so all of these, you know, like these um, uh, historical maps, they contain a lot of information, but they're also just, it's, it's full of holes. It's more hole than fabric, really. And um, they can be read, you can learn about, you know, these colonial logics, but even that is incomplete. And they, it has to be fleshed out, you know, with the knowledge held by local communities, by the genealogists who um, have been trying to um, recover some of the knowledge that has, um, we can say has been lost, I wouldn't quite say erased, but the state has actively neglected um, local knowledge as to the locations of these burial grounds for, decades, century, um, and such. And there are people's historians, um, like Mr. Leon A. Waters, who carry a lot of this knowledge and carry a lot of knowledge from um, their forebearers, um, as well as documents, and have a ton of documents and papers that, um, so there's a lot of collaboration that goes into this work, a lot of dialogue, a lot of knowledge sharing, um, in all directions, right? So not extractive because it's, I, I, it's very reciprocal. Um, and uh, so it, it was interesting actually um, because we conducted um, some remote interviews with Mr. Waters um, uh, in 2020, 2021 when we were doing this research and it was during COVID. And so it was a, you know, it was a funny time to do this project because of course, I would have loved to have been home and on the ground, but that just wasn't possible. So we were experimenting with different types of interview processes, and it gave us the opportunity to also, you know, share some of this knowledge about how to use satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so Mr. Leon is an elder, and so you know we thought a lot about okay, how do we orient him within the satellite imagery? This is a landscape that he knows intimately, um, you know, and and. Yeah. yeah, and so like, you know, kind of reorienting to that aerial perspective and he was, you know, a really quick learner, um, but it was, it was an interesting and fun process and so, you know, we shared, um, he wanted to get access to the original, you know, files of the maps which are massive and so he could print them out and um, so we shared them with him. And now we're in the final stages of translating all of that, those, you know, um, m the maps and aerial photography, basically that entire portal or GIS file into um, an online public platform um, so that it can be, you know, um, a very useful research tool for, you know, local residents, activists, genealogists, lawyers, and so on and so forth. Um, so very much like, and the, the final step is creating a GitHub repository for, you know, all of these archival documents that we went through, you know, um, ex-slave narratives, slave schedules, mortality schedules, all of these documents that exist somewhere on the internet but are massively dispersed. The, you know, um, ex-slave narratives come from a WPA project in the 1930s and 40s and um, they were all supposed to be housed with the Library of Congress but in you know classic fashion, the Louisiana documents never made it to the Library of Congress, and they they were in somebody's house in some boxes, and like various institutions around the country like hoard them in their own little archives. And so, just bringing all of this material together in one place to make it easier for people to do their own research, you know, with their own agendas, you know, um, find their own people, and and so on. Um, and I think you know, like there really is. I'm, I'm trying to think about like what, like bringing voices into that because the map stays very flat, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so as we're developing that platform, you know, it's very much, you know, in dialogue with especially the Descendants Project these days, um, Joy and Joe Banner, and, and trying to make sure that, you know, the narrative is um, reflective of how, you know, they want the story to be told. And that was all done during the FA investigation as well. So the whole video, it's, there's a 35 minute investigative film online and, you know, we went, you know, we 
made that video, we storyboarded it and went through it. We got feedback, critique, changed things, um, and then also co-wrote the final, the conclusion of that video with um, local residents. So those are all their voices and um, perspectives that, that culminate the film. Um, yeah. Hi, um, I want to thank you so much for this fascinating and beautiful and really powerful lecture. And I also want to thank you for using personal ethnography to guide us through this whole research journey. And I found that really powerful. And I think that's a wonderful surprise for me to learn that you study anthropology. <laughs> Um, and I collaborate heavily with an anthropologist, and one thing I learned from them was a kind of struggle that so many of them through field research are doing these kind of social ecological justice work, but then still limited to access to archival footages and images that has a lot of bias um, mm -hmm. from the image making from a particular period and particular persons, a collective who made the images. So, um, I can totally kind of understand your journey almost going through anthropology and then the map making or spatial studies and then geography. Um, sorry, my mind's everywhere. And well, this one uh, point you talk about people's relationship with trees. Also from my previous research um, in this Tibetan town in Southwest China, the one, one of the rare preserved forests was actually where the Tibetan Buddhists do the burial ceremonies. And that was something about the spirituality that you also talk through your research. So back to my question. Um, what is the kind of, I guess, impact through studying anthropology into the kind of spatial research? Because I feel I can see the influences of the earlier research, but I just want to kind of hear what's the kind of points you picked up from the cross-disciplinary studies. It's an interesting question. Thanks for asking. I don't know that I've been asked it before, so I'm going to try to answer because I don't know that how easy it is to disentangle all the threads. Um, you know that, you know, but I think, you know, thinking really carefully about what it means to to, you know, be in community and work with community. Um, and I think this is in, you know, really just informed I don't know that it originated with anthropology, but I think it's something that you know, in anthropology, you know, there, there, there's a history of the field that had to be completely, you know, like canceled and, you know, reimagined of, you know, um, this, this kind of extractive mode of knowledge and uh, knowledge as resource extraction, um, you know, this kind of objectification of others and like the researchers standing outside of the, you know, community that they're researching and, speaking about them and then trying to, to somehow comprehend and translate, you know, um, cultures that have been developed over the course of, you know, however many centuries and millennia, you know, and are, and are just so in incredibly complex and embedded and embodied, right? Um, and, and I think so, I guess this, you know, and, and I think contemporary anthropology has been really trying to, you know, work through this legacy and um, find another way. And so this is just, I guess, kind of ever present with me. And I, and I guess, you know, there, like, there's a lot more in contemporary anthropology. There's a lot more of this, you know, like the research subject is myself. And so I feel my work is very much, I guess it can be considered, yeah, like a personal ethnography in a way. Um, you know, I feel like I make sense of the world. Um, we all make sense of the world through our own experience, through our own body. And um, I, so I, yeah, I've, I've and I, as I, you know, was saying, I, I found it really meaningful, like very strangely meaningful to be in this remote position in London and studying my home and learning so much about my home and myself because of that distance, right? thinking about ecological diaspora, like realizing, you know, the more I'm away from New Orleans, the more I realize how, you know, New Orleans I am. And, um, you know, when I'm somewhere else, you know, I really feel, I've never felt more, I've never felt American when I lived in the US, and now that I'm not, I, I feel so American. And um, so it's, it's, you know, thinking about how, you know, you really, you are the place that you are 
from or in for a long period of time. You're literally breathing the air and eating the food, you know, and, and drinking the water and absorbing the cultural rhythms. And, you know, so you, you, you become the place that you're in. And um, so I think this kind of move between anthropology and spatial research is very much that kind of recognition of, you know, like, yeah, my, I am a part of a geography. I am also a geography. I'm, I, you know, am, you know, a, a part of an ecology, one body within a larger kind of ecological body. And yeah, so that's just what I've been, I've been trying to, I've, I've been, and when, you know, I am not in that place, you know, that place is still with me and I still therefore have, you know, um, it's like, you know, it's like quantum entanglement, right? You're still connected with the place that you're from, even though you're not there, and asking, well, what, what then is my responsibility to that place? You know, over the long term, could I, I, could I ever fully leave it behind? You know, and so I think that's also been a major driver of my work is feeling very dedicated um, to Louisiana and, and um, yeah, not wanting to abandon it because I've had the privilege, the immense privilege of being able to travel around the world. So, questions. Thank you so much. Um, I, want, I want to frame this question a bit in terms of the history of just transition as oscillating between like the poles of reform and revolution. And I want to ask, um, you know, often at times the, uh, going out of like a purely juridical model, like just transition becomes quite confrontational. And in this sense, maybe the short version of this question I want to ask is, what do you say to the Chevron executive who doesn't accept the cosmology of Western Central African spirituality. And I mean, it, in a larger sense, many of us are going to be in a situation where we will be negotiating with these people who don't, do not accept those cosmologies. So how do we, how do we like, do you have any advice for how we negotiate that? And perhaps, um, you know, what stops us from arriving at the conclusion that the only response is truly revolution? I would love to talk to the Chevron executive um, if you have a contact. I actually tried to reach, uh, I tried to connect with the Chevron archive somewhere in California, and I don't, I guess they looked me up and they um, stopped communication with me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a really interesting question because, you know, on the one hand, we could assume that, so certainly, okay, West and Central African cosmology, they probably, they, they may or may not have any connection with, but the central tenets of these cosmologies of, you know, um, a, a sense of home, what is your home, you know? Um, how do you define that? What are its parameters? You know, everyone has, you know, some kind of connection to a place that they call home. It might be a very complicated and fraught connection as well. Um, and how do we, you know, start to move from there to understanding a wider kind of conception of, of home and, and how to protect it, right? Um, I don't know, you know, um, what, you know, the, I wouldn't know what the Chevron CEO thinks or feels until I could, you know, actually connect with him or her or they. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, in Louisiana, to like kind of bring it back home a little bit to the people that I, you know, am connected with and, and know a little bit better, like there are, you know, we, we really, Louisiana is proud um, or has been, maybe it might've started to change a little bit, but Louisiana has been proud of our oil and gas development. Um, and I've been learning a lot about the historical process of creating that oil and gas citizen, like how, you know, these um, fisher communities were um, turned into corporate towns, you know. How did the festival, the uh, Morgan City, Louisiana Festival, the Shrimp and Petroleum Festival come to be, right? Um, you know, and back when, you know, Texaco um, was first, you know, creating company towns and, you know, trying to buy out people's lands and, and you know, rights of way on their land to lay pipelines in the early days, you know, these, like, Cajun fisher folk were out there with shotguns, you know, trying to keep them off their property. And state biologist Percy Viosca said in the 1930s that oil and gas development was changing the conditions of existence from its very foundations. 
And so then something was happening in the 1950s to 1970s when this resistance, this local resistance, um, started to break down. And I'm, I'm not, you know, maybe it's the money that was flowing in, maybe it's that these traditional ways of being had been so broken because oil and gas development had already, you know, through salt brine pollution and wetland degradation, you know, had already started to break these ecosystems down so that people could no longer, you know, make a living through fishing and oyster fishing and other types of muskrat trapping and other types of, you know, traditional um, economy. And so that kind of, that economic pressure, you know, changes people and it takes time and it takes, you know, generations. Um, and so people are now kind of looking back and, and, you know, some folk are wondering, you know, like, how did we get here? And in the face of, you know, like this massive coastal land loss where Louisiana has now built a wall um, a, around New Orleans, this massive seawall to protect it from rising seas and, um, and hurricane, you know, flood surge, uh, storm surge. Um, and of course there are communities on the wrong side of those walls. Um, and so people, you know, I had this conversation with environmental um, journalist Bob Marshall recently where he was saying, you know, like, yeah, like, how do you, what do you say to the, the industry workers? You know, like, pe you know, like, there's a lot of, of cynicism these days of people saying, yeah, it's a shame what's happened, but, you know, what else are we going to do? You know, like, what, there's nothing to be done, so we might as well just push it till it breaks. We might as well keep, you know, profiting until, you know, it's all, it's all over, right? Um, and I was like, no, no, absolutely not, right? Like, there is a responsibility of care for this place. People in Louisiana are obsessed with Louisiana. They're obsessed with, we're, we're very self-obsessed. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and we care deeply about our place, right? And, you know, even if, you know, if, it, it, like, if, if it's futile, right, if we're going to be this kind of walled city on the, you know, on the edge of the gulf, the practices of care, of showing care to our ecosystems is, you know, um, it's, it's just so vitally important. And I just think that there is this, you know, I, I think that these cosmologies of, of care are not so far gone. They're not so far off that they still can't be reached and, and kind of re, you know, recovered, right? Um, and it just ta it takes conversations, right? It takes conversations, a lot of conversations. It takes community, you know? Um, it takes a lot of solidarity and it's, it's all really hard, right? Um, being in community is, is hard. Being in a, in a community under so much pressure, as so many communities around the world are, is, is hard work. There's, um, on, on Friday, I was at the closing of this um, exhibition called Extractivism that was organized by, um, well, it was organized by Tulane's Architecture Center, but it was focusing on um, the, the film in progress of Jasmine Miller, who is, um, uh, originally a resident of a community in Welcome, Louisiana in St. James Parish called Jonesland. And her, and at some point in the 1920s, um, she's, a, she's a black filmmaker, and at some point in the 1920s, her family was able to acquire this um, sugarcane plantation. Mm -hmm. And they all still live on it today. She has a massive family. She might have been joking, she said, 3,000 people, I was like, I think she might have, might have been hyperbolic, but, um, and they were all there at this event. And so for the past 100 years, this huge family maintained a carefully guarded secret, which was that there was oil on that land. And they all decided that that land and their community were more valuable than the oil on that land, and that they were gonna keep it in the ground. And People found out about it, companies found out about it, prospectors, and they never let anyone on that property. And so now, at this moment, the community is for the first time, you know, sharing this, you know, carefully protected secret with the world. And I was like, this is an amazing gift. Mm -hmm. Like, there is so much courage there and wisdom, you know, that there is another way, right? And, and so, you know, I, I think there are so many stories like that, right? Mm -hmm. There are so many people who are, 
you know, imagining a just transition. The Descendants Project have this vision of cha uh, transforming this sugarcane um, plantation into a lavender field because that is lavender cleanses the soil and um, apparently sugarcane is not profitable without an enslaved labor force and vast tracts of land and so it's actually lavender yields more profit than sugarcane and so they're trying to you know think of other ways of kind of just like move out of this um, uh, this plantation mentality that you know is so pervasive and persistent but yeah it's happening and people are converting <laughs> to to our side as well Hey, Mani. It's Mariama. Oh, hey! Hey, girl. <laughs> Hi. What's up? <laughs> I'm so glad to be talking yeah. to you right now. Um, I'm like, oh my god, that's my friend. <laughs> Mari Mariama um, was a part of Blights Out um, okay. in New Orleans, like a major part, and like a, like the um, living historian who um, produced the the living glossary, which you love. <laughs> Hey, I didn't know you were here. I'm here. <laughs> I've been hiding in the back. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask, my question is kind of on a, on a similar vein as the last one, but I wanted to ask you about reparations experiments. Um, I was really interested when you were talking about um, ecological reparations and also like demanding what is owed and how that all fits together. So, and also just thinking about like the linearity of the law that you're talking about, like this rigidity that's like, there's, there's, you know, there's a way to like usurp the law in the way that you do and demand things, but there's still rigidity. So I was just curious about just how do you imagine different ecological reparations experiments? You kind of named one, like even with the lavender field and like having to get out of a, um, a mindset, like a um, plantation mindset. But I'm just curious if you have more vision or other of your kind of comrades have any more vision around ecological reparations, ex reparations experiments and even just thinking about how do you compost a plantation region? Like the whole thing is a plantation, it's all plantation geographies. And yeah. how do you compost that? Um, and also, you know, on that point, I'm just also curious about any um, other campaigns that you and your comrades have dreamed up, especially around reparations. Is there any way for reparations campaigns or any kind of organizing of wealth including holding those people accountable who have extracted the money that you so clearly have shown us um, in your mapping to be able to um, serve reparations um, experiments, um, yeah, and ecological reparations. Thank you so much. Um, so I think, I guess to start, you know, I, I think the next phase of my work is really getting into this question of composting the plantation um, and, Imagining, you know, what, what, yeah, it's a great phrase. Yeah, <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that these burial grounds are really pointing the way. Um, the fact that, you know, these are ecosystems. I mean, when you're out there, so one of the photos was actually taken from within one of those groves. And um, it really truly is a little oasis in the middle of these, like, fields of death. And there, is, there are cardinals flying all around, like a lot of cardinals. And there was a giant snake. And um, uh, this, this um, amazing um, ecologist, um, I mean, so many things, um, Bruce Sunpie Barnes, thinks that it's either a, uh, a Texas rat snake or a Louisiana pine snake, which is one of the rarest snakes in the world because of habitat loss. So these groves are archives of, you know, these thriving ecosystems that, you know, once, you know, were pervasive through this region. And so, you know, we've been having, um, especially Joe and Joy and I from the Descendants Project, have started having these conversations about, you know, like what does it mean to, like, you know, can you seed the trees like from these groves like across the region? What would it mean, you know, for them to spread out, right? I think the you know uh, conversations about reparations in general in the region are very young um, nation. There have been little kind of peppers around them, but I think it's 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 really hard to imagine because there has just been so little um, you know 
honestly, goodwill in this country around the idea of reparations. We don't have um, great examples yet of you know, reparations being paid to black people for slavery, but that is about to change. And the country of Barbados um, has uh, recently um, formulated this amazing plan to sue um, this British Lord, Lord Drax, who uh, is the heir to um, one of, uh, I think it might be the oldest sugarcane plantation in Barbados. Um, and uh, it's still um, a sugarcane plantation. There are no longer formally enslaved people on that plantation. Um, and they're using him basically as a test case for reparations. Um, so I think that's really interesting and I look forward to following that story. There are actually a number of New Orleanians who are working on that project. An artist, Rene Royale, who is Bayesian, um, living in New Orleans now, um, uh, and uh, Darcy McKinnon. Um, so a lot of like, uh, and Je you know, um, Jason Jeffries is the director. So it's interesting that there is this kind of like push and pull between Barbados and London, just kind of out of happenstance. And I wonder, you know, like what does that start to generate, you know, in the future? Um, in terms of like, yeah, like what, do, what does ecological reparations mean? I haven't fully figured it out yet. And certainly it's just not all on me to figure it out. Like I think it really is this collective kind of imagining and I think it's very culturally and regionally specific as well. Um, you know, and so in Louisiana, like speaking about practices of care, you know, one of the state's plans to try to reseed lost wetlands is to cut a hole in the levee, something called a sediment diversion, so that um, sediment from the river can flow out into the, the feed oil field. Um, the problem is that their plan doesn't acknowledge the Lafitte oil field, the canals that the existing sediment is flooding out into the sea from. So it's this really kind of um, pathological kind of, you know, and, and, and delusional kind of solution to this problem. Um, and actually the solution there's um, a scientist, Dr. Jean Turner, has been studying for a long time now, backfilling those canals, or canals throughout the entire wetlands using dredge sediment, which is actually very successful at reseeding wetlands, and it actually plugs the holes <laughs> that in the earth that are you know, causing land loss. But if the state acknowledged that the canals are a problem, they would be admitting that the, or acknowledge that there is the solution, they'd be admitting that they're the problem, and they and these corporations that they work for would be culpable. Um, so backfilling, like actually like use, like regenerating the earth, um, it's, it, the materials are all there. And then there are some other you know, groups um, who are out there trying to plant marsh grass by hand, which is just a very humble kind of almost ritual offering that could hardly match the scale of the massive, you know, several billion dollar sediment diversion project, um, but just represents a very different way of, of trying to engage with the earth. So I think there are a lot of such, you know, um, kind of humble, small scale rituals and practices that, you know, I, I'm not, I should, I should know more um, actually and, and record them. So thank you for the tip. Yeah, back one more, <laughs> one more question. One or a few? Oh. Okay, um, two more questions, then one back there, and then Andres. Okay, um, well, thank you for that amazing talk, but also the questions have been really incredible, I have to say, today. So I think everybody's contributing to this collective conversation. Absolutely. Um, I think what's so special in the conversation following your presentation is that, and also during, of course, you're sharing, you're, you're sharing super intimate stories, you know, of the conversations you've had with people that you've met, and you have a responsibility in order, you know, how you, you're sort of the ambassador of sharing their stories and you're connecting them, say, with, you know, activists new in, new Louis, in uh, Louisiana or in an academic setting or potentially, you know, even larger, like, larger spheres. Um, I, my question is, how do you reconcile some of the language in the way that some of the research is conducted out of? So, you know, from this really violent history or development of the technology of, say, cartography from, of course, colonialism or land surveys for 
private property, and of course these are land lots, right, for these plantations, to some of the really, you know, violent histories of, like say, military satellite imagery, you know, using these as the sites and language that in which your sort of narrative is, um, you know, sort of emerges out of, and how are these ways, how, what are the ways that you're finding in conversations, you know, with people, other ways of representing, you know, many of the things that we've discussed, right? Like you're, you mentioned some of these songs or, you know, smaller initiatives, but how, do you, how, how does that reconcile with these other forms of representation? Um, and from that, do you ever feel, I guess, I wonder is that, you know, there's things that you probably don't want to share via these platforms. You know, think about, um, say, if, some, if the wrong person, for example, took this amazing presentation of yours and presented in, in a totally other way, um, you know, it would sort of, it, would, it might ring very differently. So I wonder if there's sort of ways that is built into your research method that protects from basically um, ex abuses of, of data. I wonder, could you say more about the last the last point, um, what, what do you think could be used in a different way? I mean, I, I, I recently been reading some text about how now, let's say, nature is becoming data. So there are certain people who, say large companies, they're uh, datatizing trees uh, yeah. in order, uh, I think Shannon Matern calls it like a techno-vegetal solutionism to climate change in which these large corporations who are polluting, so like Chevron, they're they're taking something that we we know in a different way, and, you know, transforming them into data. So, I guess when I when I sort of consider what it means for certain people to have knowledge of of where burial grounds could be, I wonder if that's something that you you know would be released only to certain communities, or if you know that fell into the hands of these large oil companies, you know, what, what are the implications of it and how does one sort of maneuver that, you know, as we're working through these, these really complicated um, situations? Yeah, I think that's a really good question and it's a conversation that we've been having very actively. Um, and I don't think it's a conversation that, th there's no easy answer. So, you know, initially when we started, so we were, we were making this online platform. Initially we were um, going to just make a desktop platform, um, something that could be downloaded and would be able to be controlled a lot more easily. Um, but residents wanted to have something that would be publicly accessible. There were dreams of getting the information into the hands of students, of being able to take field trips, you know, out to these um, spaces and, and really, you know, have, have an iPad and actually like understand these geographies in real space. Um, and there's so much hunger, um, you know, for the recovery of this knowledge. Um, and yeah, like there, there have been concerns raised by some of the archaeologists that we're working with about what it means for the information to get out. Um, so on the one hand, you have the concern of like restricting information and then having it only be, being very exclusive when it really is something that was once, you know, um, you know, held, you know, by communities. And, um, and then on the other hand, there's the concern of, I guess, a preemptive kind of destruction of a site, right? Um, so the Louisiana Division of Archaeology has, you know, this database of all of these archaeological reports of varying quality that have been, um, con you know, written um, from surveys conducted on all of these former plantations, and it's allegedly publicly accessible, um, but you have to request permission to access them from the Division of Archaeology, and um, you have to prove that you're a legitimate researcher. And so what this means in practice is that when a researcher with a london.ac.uk email address writes to them, they get instant access. But when a resident, a local researcher, tries to get access, they're barred. Um, the reason for the ostensible reason, which people also question, for that restriction, that's not of local residents, but for the need to request permission, um, is that it, it results from NAGPRA, which is the, na uh, the National 
uh, the Native American Graves Protection Act, which was passed in the early 90s um, as a result of people um, ram ransacking indigenous burial grounds, um, you know, um, grave diggers going and desecrating sites, right? Trying to find artifacts that they could then display or sell. Um, and there's a very different kind of threat to the black burial grounds, um, which is more, you know, it's not necessarily that people are going to try to destroy them, you know, in order to profit from them in that direct way, right? But actually, profit through their erasure. Um, and so like, in, in a way, the lack of knowledge about them also facilitates their eventual erasure because if people don't know that they're there and can demand their protection, then there's nothing really stopping the companies. So it's a, it's a, it's a very kind of, it's a funny catch 22. And I was actually just speaking about this earlier today and asking once again, even though I was just meeting with we just had a workshop in New Orleans last week where everyone is really excited for it to go live and it's got like a launch date. And then I was just having this thought again of like, I was reading a lot about secrecy and having this thought again about, you know, what it means. And then thinking about Jones Land and how mm -hmm. the moment for that secrecy, you know, to end has come. And so how do we know, you know, that we're in that moment? I don't know, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very important question. In terms of the language of um, the materials, so the thing, you know, for the forensic architecture cartographic exercise, that language, the language of those surveys is actually the language of the land because all of those lines, you know, those plantation borders, the field paths, et cetera, et cetera, are inscribed into the land. And the footprint of the sugar mills and the slave quarters are oftentimes scars left on the earth. So learning to read that language, you know, is important for understanding, you know, um, for, for reading the earth, right? And understanding um, how the earth has been made as such, right? And of course, then locating burial grounds and finding a way beyond the world as it has um, been made. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think for me, like, it's really important to, to study that language, to understand it um, in order to move beyond it and, and then also to, to share it with others. And it's been really amazing. This whole process over the years has been really amazing um, as, you know, local residents, you know, are like, wow, you know, like, I, I, I always, you know, would see these oak trees here and wonder why they're all in the straight line. And now I know that these are the oak trees that were leading up to the big house on this plantation. Or, you know, local residents also have a lot of knowledge of, oh, that street is called Backquarters Road. Oh, yeah, it's where the slave quarters used to be. And then they see it spatialized. And, you know, it's this kind of, there's this excitement, right, of the knowledge that people have been carrying in their heads being kind of evidence in this way. And I think because of this kind of systemic neglect of local knowledge by the state, you know, it's, it's really, it's reaffirming and it's exciting. I mean, there, there becomes this kind of treasure hunt um, feeling, you know, with, with recovering a lot of these, these sites. And people have a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of excitement about going through, going through these materials. Um, so, so, yeah, I think the language, it's hard. But it's, it's it, 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 yeah, it's, it's the predominant language, like English, in the world. And it does facilitate a certain amount of, um, uh, yeah, connection, right, um, for what it's worth. And then, you know, the, the image, the, the video at the beginning of the presentation, what I didn't say is that all of those are the same lines and points that um, I was mapping for Fall the Oil. So when I was spending hundreds of hours, you know, organizing them by company and just kind of staring at the screen during the pandemic, you know, I started to see these shapes kind of emerging from the lines and points and started to imagine them as constellations. And so this language, this data heavy language of the state and these corporations started to communicate something different to me about cosmology 
Um, and so I, I had this vision of you know, animating them and doing that, and I eventually did it. And so the film that I made for, but I guess I always was kind of, um, I was lucky to get this commission from the Biennale because you know, my focus had always been follow the oil. It, it had been you know, like pushing this out because I saw that there was a public need and I, I, I wanted to make sure it happened, right? And um, I kind of, I set aside this whole other kind of, I guess, part of myself. Um, and so when I got this commission from the Biennale, I, like the film was basically, like it was already in my head, kind of fully formed. Um, I, 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 and it, was, it, it flowed very naturally out of me because it had been kind of developing um, simultaneously with that other work. And for that, I, yes, still had this, you know, aerial perspective, which I like to think not as like seeing like a state, but seeing as a bird or an ancestor. But also I spent a lot of time canoeing um, through uh, the wetlands and capturing, you know, footage of, of water. And, um, and so it experimented with like kind of merging those two perspectives, the from the ground, from the water with um, the aerial in order to try to yeah, encompass, I guess, the fullness of, of the perspectives of the various, you know, entities of the world. Um, yeah. Nice question. Yeah. Well, this amazing uh, lecture and work, of course, the swamp. Uh, you mentioned it several times, and I think that, and also the last movie that you saw uh, with the water flowing overlap to the image of the land from above uh, and, the, uh, and the way that you're talking now and it seems that the, the, the swamp is playing, is doing a lot of work for, for you, right? Yeah. And somehow it's also very different to these piped uh, yeah. ecosystems of the extractive uh, industries. Also, it seems to be connected to this notion of the, of the body as something that is flowing, diluted, uh, unzipped up, very different to the obsession of individuality of the extractivist economies, economies. Uh, so I, I think that there's something there of the, uh, another cosmology that you're announcing that could be also the response, I feel, not the alternative or the, uh, a form. And I wonder what that, that, that also connects with the long trajectory of histories of slaverism and unslaverism. And I'm thinking, for instance, of the stories of the fugitives that would find shelter in the swamps that mm -hmm. Riley Snowton has narrated. And I think there's so much there in the swamp. And I, I, I <laughs> think it's very important to ask you about this because there's yeah. so many work, so, so many ideas probably there, right? And yeah, the swamp, I mean, swamps, Swamps are always doing a lot. <laughs> and I, I've, I've been doing a little bit of writing um, about swamps since my MA, like thinking, like, you know, just really thinking about the racialization of, of different landscapes um, and, you know, the kind of the preference of, you know, the clear blue water of the, you know, Florida beaches and the white sands versus, you know, the murky brown, you know, obscure waters of the swamp that, you know, every statesman, you know, is drawn either in practice or in metaphor to try to drain, right, and control. And they're seen as these, you know, festering cesspools of disease and, you know, venomous snakes and <laughs> alligators whom I love. Uh, my favorite creatures, and you know they're cradles of civilization everywhere in the world. And so to me, there's just something I don't know so remarkable about that. Like the place that we've come, that we've emerged from, is so reviled. And it kind of reminds me of there's this um, this Georges Bataille um, piece. I think it's called The Big Toe, but he like writes about how the big toe is the most hated part of the human body because it's the closest to the ground. And we prefer the head because it's the closest to the sky and we imagine ourselves as, you know, gods. And, and <laughs> so we want to leave the earth that is our mother and our origin in favor of the father of the sky. I don't know if he says all that. He says something, something like that. And um, yeah, so I think that there, there definitely is something there in the swamps and I want to spend some more time thinking about it. And, I have to like always 
I need to like control how far I reach, um, but I'm really interested in at some point also researching, you know, the Mesopotamian marshes and the Nile Delta and the Niger Delta, these other cradles of civilizations, and you know, um, all of these places that are rich with oil, you know, and like how it is that you know you have these like these cycles of life and death over eons, and life ultimately settles as death, as these, you know, subterranean, these, you know, fields of oil and gas. And we can kind of imagine these oil and gas fields as, you know, the final resting places of millennia of, of life, right? Um, and these, these, you know, deltaic wetlands, these riverine deltas in particular, where you've got this alluvial sediment and salt water merging and mixing and the continental shelf, you know, and all of these dynamics coming together, um, you know, like they're, they draw people, you know, two dozen indigenous nations in Louisiana, they draw people to these places and then they also attract their destroyers, right? They attract the conquerors and the oil corporations, right? Um, so yeah, this is like, this is definitely a space that I'm really interested in kind of pushing further and yes, especially in the context of marinage and you know, how it is that, because in Louisiana, it's, it's the back swamps in Haiti and Jamaica and Brazil, it's the forested mountains, these kind of treacherous zones that offer the possibility of freedom. And so, you know, what can we learn today um, from those geographies and those histories? Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.